So <coughs> we have um, ballpark an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half, if we want to go that long. Um, I like to um, leave people feeling like they've got their money's worth. And so my talks, I always prepare my talks long. Um, I don't want to rush through all the transparencies I have here. Um, in fact, or all the slides. Uh, in fact, uh, um, this talk is posted on the webpage for this meeting today. And there's a background article as well. There's a, I wrote an encyclopedia article about the Bayesian story um, a year or so ago. Oops, try that again. Click over here maybe this time. And that should be on the web page as well. I think it is. Um, and so I will uh, pick out one or two examples from the encyclopedia article, but mostly I'll focus my uh, attention on the stuff in the organized talk. And I would encourage you, if you have a question or a comment, to make your way to the microphone in the middle there uh, so that your comment can be recorded as part of the whole proceedings. And um, let's just have this be quite informal. I may ask you some questions from time to time, and I hope that you'll ask me some as well. I'm going to talk some about the history of the process of uncertainty quantification, which is interesting. There are a number of points in the story that are surprising. Uh, and I hope to share with you some ideas about how to process um, information in a way that takes full account of the uncertainties that you have, and also to talk in a general way about how to make choices in the face of such uncertainty. So <clears throat> I'm a statistician. Um, if you got, let's say, 100 statisticians together in the same room, and that is a, a, a daunting image, isn't it? Um, uh, and ask them what they all thought was the meaning of their profession, um, you would probably get something like 30 or 40 substantively different answers to that. It's a little bit of a slippery thing. Um, here's mine. Um, for me, statistics is the study of uncertainty, how to measure it well, and how to make good choices in the face of it. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, <clears throat> uncertainty is, is a state of incomplete information about something of interest to you. So statistics is about information processing. It hasn't always seemed that way to everybody who was doing it, but that's basically what it is. Uh, that's the, the point of view that makes the most sense to me, and I think that rings true with everybody in the room as well, that we're all in the process, in the business of trying to gather information and process it to help people answer tough questions. So um, uncertainty is everywhere in everything we do, and so statistics has the potential to be helpful in almost every aspect of daily life, uh, including both science which I'll think of here as the simple acquisition of information and knowledge for its own sake without an attempt to do anything with that information. So not only is statistics potentially helpful in science, but also in decision making, which is the process of putting that knowledge to use to make a choice amongst available actions. And in spite of the fact that you don't have all the information that you need potentially to make the very best decision you could possibly make. We are forced every day, uh, multiple times every day as, as humans, to make choices on the basis of incomplete information. So <clears throat> when you notice you're uncertain about something, um, the, the fundamental things that we're going to be talking about being uncertain about here are true-false propositions whose truth status may be unknown to you. And so here are a couple examples. Um, uh, this particular patient, you're a doctor, and someone has just come into um, your office. Um, he, let's say the patient, to have a pronoun, and um, um, he is wondering if he's HIV positive. And so the statement, the proposition, the true-false statement, this patient is HIV positive, is a statement about which both the doctor and the patient are uncertain. Uh, also, um, another one um, that, that I would guess, unless you have some sort of um, amazing prognostic ability of um, we are not entirely clear on the, the truth or falsity of the statement, Obama will win a second term as U.S. president um, in 2012. It's still many months for away from the election. So both these things are true-false statements that we have uncertainty about. And when you notice you're uncertain about something, it's natural to want several things. First of all, to quantify how much uncertainty you have. And then secondly, to figure out how to reduce your uncertainty. Um, of course, uncertainty is one of these things where too much of it is not very good. You don't want to have very much. 
And so you usually find yourself in a position of having more than you like. And so what can you do to reduce your uncertainty? Uh, if the answer to, to part A there is, is higher than the level necessary to achieve your goals. So, okay. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is quantifying uncertainty and then figuring out how to reduce it. That's essentially what this is about. Um, and probability uh, is the part of math that um, is devoted to quantifying uncertainty. And so it plays a fundamental role in statistics. And so does data gathering because as we all know, the best way to decrease your uncertainty about something is to gather new information, data uh, relevant to that. And then that creates um, a question about how to combine information as you go along. You have a certain degree of uncertainty about something right now, and you have the time and the money to gather new information to decrease your uncertainty. How should that new information be combined with your existing information in a way that produces an answer that makes sense mathematically and also in a real world um, way. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, if you look at what statisticians do, um, there are four basic things that we find ourselves doing. Description, inference, prediction, and decision. So um, description um, refers to the task of trying to make summaries, graphic, often graphical and numerical, of an existing data set without any attempt to generalize outward from it. So uh, I work a lot with people in the division of research at the Kaiser Permanente Hospital chain. And if we have data from the year 2010 for all the 17 Northern California Kaiser hospitals about what the mortality rates were for each of a bunch of diseases, and I make a data set like that, to tell you what the mortality rate was for people with an admission diagnosis of heart attack at one of the Kaiser hospitals, that's a descriptive statement. I'm just trying to say what happened at that hospital. But if I wanted to do something more ambitious, to try to use the information in 2010 to, for example, to predict what might be happening in 2011, that's a much more ambitious goal. It's easy to say what happened already, that's just a descriptive task, but then to use that information to try to generalize outward either in time or in space or in some other way, that generalization is always going to be accompanied with un by uncertainty, and so that's, again, where we see that it's going to be important to be able to quantify such uncertainty. Um, so description um, is an... In almost completely non-probabilistic task. Um, and uh, um, as a result, I'm not going to talk about it much tonight. In fact, that's probably the last I'm going to say about it tonight. Um, the other tasks are harder, and they all do involve probability. Um, the second thing that, that people in statistics do is to try to draw inference, inferential conclusions about the nature of the underlying process generating the data. Um, usually, when you're in a situation in which information comes to you, it comes in a stream unfolding in time or space or both. And so uh, you can think of a process that gives rise to the data. And your goal in inference is to try to uh, gain some understanding of the underlying characteristics of the process that's generating the data. That will help you say something as accurately as you can about future data, for example. Um, and um, this is the statistical version of what philosophers have been thinking about for many centuries. The uh, Scottish philosopher David Hume uh, referred to um, what we now call statistical inference as the problem of induction. Uh, and it includes, as uh, special cases, uh, answering questions about causality. What was it that caused something? If you see something happening in the world, what was it that caused that? And then also generalizing outward from a sample of data values to a broader universe of discourse. So for instance, if I didn't have enough money to gather information on all of the Kaiser patients in a particular year, I might choose to before the era of electronic medical records, which we we're moving um, uh, into right now, um, if I was interested in saying something about what happened at Kaiser in 2004, and I didn't have enough money to sample all the patients with heart attack, um, then I could take a carefully chosen subset of those patients and try to learn what I can about them and make, use that to make an intelligent guess about all the other patients in that particular year who were not sampled. So generalizing outward from a sample of data values to a larger universe, a population, that's going to be an example of inference as well. And then um, prediction uh, is, of course, something absolutely central to any, anyone interested in, in information processing. Trying to predict future data on the basis of past data, not only making individual guesses for what I think will happen, what will, what will the um, spot price of oil be um, six months from now, uh, but also 
quantifying how much uncertainty I have about those predictions. I think it's going to be blah, blah dollars, you know, give or take, blah, blah dollars. So the prediction process has two parts to it, coming up with the single best guess and coming up with a, an intelligent uncertainty band around that guess. And um, prediction is important in many things, especially in science because good scientific theories make good predictions and bad scientific theories make bad predictions. That's one of the best ways we know whether a theory is good or bad. And so if you can uh, encourage a scientific theory when it's confronted with data to make predictions about future data values that the theory hasn't, hasn't had contact with yet, so to speak, and you compare those, those predictions with what actually happens in the world, that's a good way to know whether you have a good theory or, or a bad theory. Um, it's also important in this final activity, decision making, because it turns out that um, to try to do it carefully, um, if you think about how you yourself make choices um, when you don't necessarily have all the information you want, first you make a list of all the possible actions you're thinking of choosing between, and then you try to predict the future under each of those actions and choose your favorite future. That's basically what decision making is about. And so it has an inherently predictive character as well. So um, here's probability um, that I've, uh, a word I've introduced so far. Um, and I'll say more about the history as we go along. Um, it's actually remarkable. Uh, we've been thinking carefully about mathematics for several thousand years now as a species. And actually, we've only been thinking carefully about uh, uncertainty quantification for a much smaller period of time than that. It, the systematic study of probability goes back to an exchange of letters between the, the uh, um, excellent French mathematicians Pascal and Fermat in the middle of the 1600s. Uh, the version of probability they developed turns out to be too simplistic, unfortunately, to help in, in problems of contemporary complexity. So uh, we don't pay a lot of attention to their uh, method anymore. They were thinking about uh, simple games of chance. So maybe there's a, um, I have a box here and it has 10 balls in it and uh, eight of them are white and two of them are red and we're gonna bet on, we're gonna reach in and take a ball out and uh, bet on whether the ball is red or not, for example. Um, and the balls are gonna be messed around in such a way that there's no systematic tendency for any one ball to be chosen more often than another one and so on. Um, and their approach was to say, well, what are all the different ways it could come, the, uh, the experiment of doing this, that I, uh, something I could think of doing over and over again, how many different ways are there to do it? Well, there's 10. And how many of them are favorable to getting a red ball? Well, there's two. And is there any reason why any of those 10 possibilities is more plausible than any, any other? And by the process of messing the balls about in the box to make it such that there isn't any reason for one ball to be more plausible than another, you say to yourself, they all seem equally plausible to me. And so, Pascal and Fermat said, well, okay, I'm gonna call the probability of that. I'll count how many of the outcomes are favorable, two, and put that in the numerator, and I'll count how many outcomes there are together, 10, and I'm gonna define that to be the, the probability, two tenths. So that was what they invented around 1650. That turns out not to be um, a model for the world that is rich enough in complexity to capture the sorts of things that we do these days. So I won't, that's called the classical approach, and I won't talk about it anymore. Instead, two other uh, ways to give meaning to the concept of probability are in current use today. One is called the relative frequency or frequentist approach, and the other one is called the Bayesian approach. In the relative frequency or frequentist approach, you have to restrict attention to things that are inherently repeatable under conditions that are as close to identical as possible, and then you imagine repeating the process over and over again and keep track of the relative frequency with which something of interest to you happens in those repetitions and then let the um, number of such um, hypothetical repetitions go to infinity and hope that that relative frequency settles down to a limit. And if it does, that's the frequentist definition of the probability of that particular um, event happening. And this approach is much later. Um, it was developed by uh, around 1870 by a guy called John Venn of, of Venn diagram fame, and George Boole, the guy who, who developed what we now call Boolean logic, was involved as well. And it was refined in the 1930s by a mathematician named uh, Richard von Mises. So that's one of the two ways to think about probability that are still quite, used, quite um, helpful today. The other approach is quite different. In the Bayesian approach, which I'm mostly gonna be talking about today, um, the argument B, of the probability operator, probability B given A, so the, the vertical bar stands for the word given, and so um, people always write it in that order, probability of B given A. So the argument B of this operator is a true-false proposition whose true status is unknown to you, 
And the probability of B given A represents the weight of evidence in favor of the truth of B given the information in A. And A could be just a single true-false statement or a whole collection of them, whatever you might like. Um, this approach was first developed by uh, a uh, mathematician and uh, um, cleric. His, his day job was as a minister, um, and his um, pleasure was to do math, named Thomas Bayes, who worked in the early to middle 1700s, and the great, great French mathematician Laplace, who independently rediscovered Bayes' ideas about 30 years after Bayes died, and then went much deeper with them than Bayes had done. Um, so this was an 18th century invention. This is a way to think about what probability means. And lots of people have made big contributions to it uh, in the 20th century, including some famous names uh, from economics and, a number of, and computer science and a number of other fields. Now it turns out that the Bayesian story includes the Frequentist story as a special case. So you might think that that would be the end of it. In fact, you might think, why did Van and Bull and those guys invent the frequency story when it's, it's in fact, a special case of the Bayesian story? Um, well, um, that in itself is interesting. Um, there's a but, um, and here are two aspects to it. First of all, in quantifying your uncertainty about something unknown to you, as we'll see as we go along today, the Bayesian story requires you to bring all relevant information to bear on your uncertainty quantification. And this involves combining information both internal to any data set you have and also external to that data set. And rather strangely, the external information part of this approach was controversial in the 20th century. Statisticians are mild-mannered people. There's an old joke about a statistician being someone who doesn't have enough personality to become an accountant. Uh, <laughs> And so mostly we are quite calm, uh, when, even when we're all brought together, hundreds in a room. Um, but the one thing that, that um, was capable of getting statisticians to shout at each other in the 20th century anyway was the so-called controversy over these two different ways of thinking about the meaning of probability, the frequency story and the Bayesian story. And um, um, I will try to explain why this business about bringing in information external, ex external to your data set was controversial and why, in fact, most of that controversy was, was um, misplaced. Moreover, uh, this is a more practical reason, uh, it's going to turn out that the, the fundamental mathematical operation that makes the Bayesian story go is, is integrals, and in fact, um, you get high dimensional integrals as well, and approximating high dimensional integrals is a hard problem. Um, Mr. Bayes himself, when he first started thinking about this in the 1750s or so, uh, didn't have any idea how to approximate some of the integrals that arose in his work. Um, Laplace did have an idea about how to do that. In fact, he invented a method that he used for the rest of his life that works um, rather well. And I'll say more about the history of that as well. Um, uh, his method was forgotten, interestingly, after he died uh, and had to be independently reinvented by applied mathematicians in the 1950s under the name saddle point approximation. For a long time, um, people didn't know how to approximate these high dimensional integrals in an accurate way. Um, and it turns out that the frequency story was a much better technology for the early part of the 20th century because it's based upon maximizing rather than integrating a function. And maximization, which is based on derivatives, is an inherently much easier thing to do than integration, much harder problem. And so um, that's a practical reason why the Bayesian story um, did not uh, get a whole lot of traction in the early to middle part of the 20th century. This business about approximating these integrals was a severe limitation to the paradigm for a long time, um, really from when Bayes first started thinking about it all the way through to the 1980s. Then around 1990, two things happened at about the same moment that completely changed the picture. First of all, um, it turns out that some people um, trying to solve problems connected with developing the atom bomb during World War II, led by uh, a, a Greek-American applied mathematician named Nick Metropolis and a, a Polish-American, a pure mathematician who also did some applied work named Stanislav Ulam. Um, they were working at the intersection between chemistry and physics in the 1940s to try to build the bomb. They actually um, developed an algorithm for approximating integrals that are a lot like the ones that arise in Bayesian statistics. Although they were not trying to solve the Bayesian problem, they were trying to solve a problem that was similar to the Bayesian problem. And they published their, their algorithm about 10 years after they invented it. Um, since they were working for the military at the time, 
The military didn't allow them to publish it initially. They had to wait about 10 years from when they first worked it out to when they could publish it in the open literature. So the so-called metropolis algorithm is in the open literature around the year 1953 or so. Um, and statisticians paid no attention to it at all because it was in the chemical physics literature and statisticians didn't read that literature. Moreover, um, it was couched in the language of potential functions in physics and it didn't look like the problems that, that Metropolis and Ulam were solving were the same as the Bayesian integral problems that arise in Bayesian inference. Um, we are lucky these days to have excellent search engines, but if you had a search engine and a computer fast enough to, to do some serious searching back, let's say, in the early 1960s, um, you would have had a hard time as a Bayesian statistician trying to find this article because all of the words that describe what they were doing had nothing to do with Bayesian statistics. And so it's great to have search engines, but something we really need to solve problems of this kind, and maybe there are people in the room who've already thought about this a little bit, um, and I realize that what I'm about to say is a hard problem, um, so okay. But what we really need is something that might be called an analogy engine. I want to be able to go to the engine and say, find me all the papers that solve a problem like the following problem. And with such an engine, then you could find the Metropolis Ulam paper even if you didn't know it existed in some literature other than your own. Of course, that requires making formal the idea of how one problem is like another or not like another, and that in itself is the root of the difficulty, why we don't currently have an analogy engine, but that's, that's what you would have needed um, uh, until finally, um, w it took 50 years for, for, for Bayesian statisticians to stumble upon this, this algorithm, which is based on Markov chains, and it's based upon the, the idea of using um, randomization in a very clever way. And um, Metropolis and another, uh, well, Metropolis and Ulam invented the, the term uh, Monte Carlo. And so this technique is called Markov Chain Monte Carlo now, MCMC for short. And we now know how to do that. Um, their algorithm was astonishingly ahead of its time because um, digital computers had not been in, even invented when they invented the algorithm. Uh, it took many decades until computers got fast enough to be able to implement the algorithm. Uh, and in fact, uh, it was just right around 1990 that desktop computers finally got fast enough to implement this Metropolis algorithm in a feasibly short amount of time, by which I mean you could put a calculation together at 6 o'clock at night and get, come back in again at 9 o'clock the next morning on your desktop and there would be answers for you. So if you gave your desktop around 1990 um, uh, overnight ability, something on the order of 12 hours, um, that's computers finally got fast enough to make this, this possible. Now, the last century was definitely a frequentist century, and I've, I've mentioned why already, in large part because maximization was an excellent technology for the 1920s, which is when Fisher first emphasized it. I'm going to talk about Fisher some today. He was a, a great statistician and an even greater geneticist, um, and he pointed out that there was a way to do statistical inference based upon maximization which we'll see today, I hope we'll have time to see, turns out to be an approximation to the Bayesian story, but based only on maximizing rather than integrating. And so that was a great technology for the year 1925 when Fisher first published on it, um, because it was just the right tool. And it was the right tool for the next 50 years, really, until computers finally started getting fast enough. But a consensus is now emerging around the following idea, that in our century now, it's important for people interested in data to be fluent in both the frequentist and the Bayesian ways of thinking. Now, last century, many people acted as if you had to choose one of these two paradigms and then defend it against attacks, fierce attacks, from people who chose the other paradigm. This is the way this story was framed in the 20th century. In fact, that was a mistaken framing because I will try to show you today that there are elements of strength and weakness in both of these two probability paradigms. It is not the case that one of them uniformly dominates the other. And so therefore, it's foolish to try to stake your whole career on one of them and shout at the people who stake their career on the other one. That's stupid when both of them have both strengths and weaknesses. Instead, our job is to develop a fusion of the two approaches that emphasizes the strengths of that fusion and de-emphasizes the weaknesses. And I'm not going to try to proselytize today for the Bayesian story because it's only part of the broad picture. Um, uh, what I would like to do is to 
tell you a little bit about both stories and try to motivate the idea that it's good to know about both stories here in the 21st century. And I will share with you my personal fusion. I find it useful to reason in a Bayesian way when formulating my inferences and predictions and decisions, because it turns out the Bayesian way is the most flexible approach that anybody's figured out so far for incorporating all relevant sources of uncertainty into your answers. So I find it useful to reason in a Bayesian way when formulating my inferences and predictions and decisions, but then I find it useful to reason in a frequentist way when paying attention to how often I get the right answer, which is a fundamental scientific activity which has not been brought into the Bayesian way of looking at things until rather recently. Uh, I'm going to refer to that process of paying attention to how often I get the right answer. I'm going to talk about that using the word calibration. I want to know if I go around saying that, that some assertions I'm making are, are going to be right about 90% of the time, then it's incumbent upon me as a scientist to actually find out whether they really are true about 90% of the time. And that's a calibration style or collaborative activity. And it turns out that that's an easy thing to think about from the frequency point of view because you, you heard me say it. I'm interested in what proportion of my statements are true. That's, a, that's counting. It's a, it's a relative frequency sort of thing to do. So what I hope to do tonight is to expand on these brief historical notes I've mentioned already and give some examples of Bayesian inference and prediction and decision making, time permitting, um, mainly in, in things to do with medicine because that's the, the applied field that I work in the most. So let's spend a little time talking about the history. Uh, there's a great um, website, um, the U URL right there in, in um, um, Britain um, at St. Andrews. Um, according to that website, mathematics began in Babylonia around 4,000 years ago. Um, the Babylonians were the first people to develop a systematic way to record and manipulate numbers, both integers and fractions. So that was sort of the beginning of mathematics for us as a species. Everybody probably before that had intuitive notions of this is three rocks and this is seven rocks and so on, but, um, uh, or there's more rocks over here than there are over there, that, that sort of thing. But the Babylonians were the first people to figure out how to write it down and to, to manipulate numbers. Now gambling, which was the set of problems that motivated Pascal and Fermat, um, is even older. Um, um, it's, you would have thought it would have prompted a kind of mathematics based on what we now call randomness. Um, people have been able to find dice-like objects made from animal bones that go back 6,500 years. And so we've been gambling as a species for that long, and we've been thinking mathematically as a species for a good bit of that time, and yet no one seems to have laid down the foundations of probability until around 350 years ago. The ancient Greeks, who were the people who probably took mathematics to its highest pinnacle uh, in uh, several thousand years ago, they had no notion of what we now call chance or probability or randomness. It, it ran counter to their way of looking at the world in terms of essentially what you might call their religion. It just didn't fit into their way of looking at things, so they didn't even think about it. A uh, few people did some stuff a bit earlier than that, but then we have Pascal and Fermat. And I mentioned the classical approach before. You enumerate the so-called elemental outcomes, um, the fundamental possibilities in the process under study in a way that makes them equipossible. Which is meant by which is meant that um, so that none of them would be favored over any other in hypothetical repetitions, and then you just have to count things. You count the number of uh, elemental outcomes, EOs, that's your denominator, and the number of them favorable to the thing you're looking at, that's your numerator, and just take the ratio. And so that worked great for um, idealized games of chance, things involving um, uh, shuffling and dealing out um, cards from well shuffled decks, um, things like uh, roulette and coins and dice, but it fails in complicated problems like those people think about routinely today. So suppose I had a data set with 100,000 observations and I had a, an outcome variable and I was trying to predict it from 1,000 predictors. Um, what are the elemental outcomes that you're counting? Um, there is a narrative you could tell, but it doesn't actually advance the ball very much to try to tell it. So basically, no one uses this approach anymore except to teach probability the, at the very beginning. Uh, if you think back to when you first heard about probability in elementary school or whenever it was, that's the approach they taught you probably, because it's a simple way to think about what's going on. Okay, um, then um, the trouble with the Pascal Fermat approach is that they hadn't thought of the idea of working out the chance of something being true given that you knew something else was true. They had no notion of conditional probability in what they were doing, because all the things they were doing they thought of as, as unconditional. And so um, Mr. Bayes, Reverend Bayes, um, was the first person to 
invent the definition of conditional probability. He said, well, if you want to know how often B would happen among those occasions when A happened, then work out the, chan the rate at which both of them happened and divide that by the, the rate at which the first one happened, the one that you know is true happened. If you're wondering what's the chance of it raining um, two Saturdays from now, given that it's rained um, one Saturday from now, then you have to start as your base with the, um, the chance, the frequency with which it's going to rain one Saturday from now. That's your, that's your denominator, so to speak. And among all the occasions when it do does rain uh, next Saturday, how often does it rain in addition to that next, the, the following Saturday? So he invented that definition. Excellent. And now we multiply um, P of A, uh, uh, by both, uh, multiply both sides by P of A. And so he figured out a way to work out the chance of two true-false propositions, A and B, uh, being true simultaneously. And this is um, what people now, for obvious reasons, call the product rule. It's a kind of a chain rule. It says the chance of them both being true is equal to the product of the first one times the chance of the second one, given that you know the first one's true. And you can write it in the other order if you want. You can write it as P of B times A given B, and that's also the same thing. He defined that um, while he was still alive, and then he applied that to some things that seemed to him to be controversial in a document that he thought was so controversial that he was afraid to publish it while he was alive. He was a relatively well-known guy. Um, he was a member of the Royal Society, a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, and he waited until after he died and gave all his papers to his friend Richard Price and said, um, oh, Richard, would you please publish this under my name after I'm dead? Um, now, there are people in history who went ahead and took th something like that and published it under their own name. That's, that's been done once or twice in history. So it's a, a little bit of a wonder that we're not calling this Pricean statistics right now, because he could have done that. But Price was a good guy, and instead he published Bayes' ideas um, posthumously under Bayes' name. Bayes was interested in cause and effect relationships. You see something happening in the world. You see an effect. For example, you see people dying of a disease. And then you naturally wonder, what was the cause? Did they die because they were drinking the water, or eating something, or breathing the air? What exactly was it that was going on? And he was the first person to have the combination of bravery and imagination to think about um, a more challenging form of causality. If I go up on my roof and drop a hammer every time it falls to the ground, instead of going floating up into the air, that's a kind of deterministic causality. OK, and it's great to know about things like that, because you probably are on to some sort of rule of physics at that point, right? But what, what Bayes noticed was that, in fact, there were other things that you can see in the world that didn't have a deterministic causal relationship, using our words today, it had what we would call a probabilistic ca uh, causal relationship. Namely, um, if you drank the water, among the people who drank the water, their rate of dying was higher than the people who didn't drink the water. It wasn't the case that everybody who drank the water died. It was that it increased your, pro your probability of dying. And so he was the first person. That's a big step forward in causality, to go to talk about probabilistic causation. And so um, he wanted to know um, what was the probability of a particular cause being the one that actually caused things, given that you see a particular effect in the world. That's what he was interested in. So he wants P of cause given effect. And he noticed right away that effect given cause is a lot easier. If I told you what was really going on, then it's easier to predict what would happen than the other way around. So basically, he noticed right away that the question was, how does the probability of B given A, how does that depend on A given B? In other words, in today's language, he wanted to reverse the order of conditioning. How should he do that? And so first he started by inventing this definition of conditional probability, then he applied it to reverse the order of conditioning. So he wrote down the definition in the other order. And so now we have another statement, in about, and, and now we have A and B equaling this other thing. But look, a minute ago we had B and A, which is the same as A and B, equaling something else, and so now those other things must be equal to each other. So he has this equal to that, and he can equate the two, and therefore he can solve for what he wants to get. And so right there is a little teeny th proof of what's now called Bayes' theorem applied to true-false propositions. Um, now that was pretty easy. Um, nice work if you can get it to have your name be completely immortal for the rest of the entire human race's history just by doing something that simple. Um, but in fact, his real insight was to figure out what the correct definition of conditional probability was, and then the theorem is basically just a really simple, it's just a one-liner from the theorem. But now he has what he wants, because look what it says. It says to work out the chance of B given A, you should work out the chance of B, and multiply it by the chance of A given B, and divide by the chance of A. 
That's just directly from his definition of conditional probability. Now, what did he want to do with this? Well, for him, he, he wasn't satisfied with these A and B both being true-false propositions. For him, B stood for an unknown rate at which something happens, for example, the rate at which people die um, as a function of having um, drank the water or whatever. And today, we might use the symbol theta for the part about cor con corresponding to B right here. And theta is just some number between 0 and 1 because it represents a rate at which something happens. And A, for him, stood for some data relevant to theta. And in fact, he started out with data sets that were a string of binary outcomes. So he has a bunch of ones and zeros. So for him, A was a data set, I'm going to call it lowercase y, and by that I mean a vector y1 through yn, where each of the y's was a one zero variable, having it, each one of them having an underlying success rate of theta, but you couldn't tell for sure who was going to be a one or who was going to be a zero. So it's basically, did you die or not? y sub i is a one if the person dies and a zero if they lived, and that depends upon um, whether they drank the water or not. And so if you, um, if you rephrase his theorem right here in the language of cause and effect, in terms of unknown and data, the unknown acts like the effect we're wondering about, and the data acts like the, I'm sorry, the unknown acts like the cause, and the data acts like the effect. So what's the chance of the unknown being a particular thing, given you know how the data came out? And if I stick that into his formula, it says, well, you should work out and I'm going to go over to a language of information. Your information about the unknown given the data turns out to be the product of your information about the unknown times your information about the data given the unknown divided by your information about the data. So that's what turns out to be in terms of words for his problem. And he conjectured, but did not prove, um, Laplace proved it later, that his theorem still applies when b is a real number theta and a is a vector of real numbers. And so in contemporary notation, we would have this. This is Bayes' theorem where the unknown thing is a, a number and the data set is itself a whole bunch of numbers, a vector of numbers. And so what are these things? Um, you may remember back to your study of probability. Probably most people in the room had to take a probability course at one point. Um, and so when you have something that can live, for example, theta, can live more or less continuously along the number line from 0 to 1. And so you summarize the probability information about something that lives continuously like that by means of a histogram or a smooth density curve, for example. And so this thing here called p of theta represents a probability density. It's, it's something like a, imagine a picture where theta is running along the horizontal scale and the frequency with which theta occurs in repetitions or something like that is on the vertical scale. Think of a picture like that. You could have a series of bars that would be a histogram version of that picture, or you could have a smooth curve that approximates the bars. That would be what people call a density. So um, p of theta is a density for theta. p of y is a density for y. And these other two things are conditional, what are called conditional probability densities. p of y given theta, it looks uh, like it's the um, conditional behavior of how y would come out if you knew what theta was. And this one over here stands for the information about theta in light of what you have found in the data set y. OK, so this requires some further interpreting. Uh, I would like to use this equation after the data set y has arrived to quantify my uncertainty about theta in light of the data set y. And so I want to do what people call conditioning on the data. And what that means is I want to think of the left-hand side as a function of theta for fixed y, because I've already got my data. There's nothing unknown about the data if, once I've already got it. And I'm still in the position of having theta be the unknown. So I want to think of the left-hand side as a function of theta for fixed y. And that means, I, because it's an equation, I have to think of the right-hand side the same way. So several consequences immediately arise. First of all, if I'm thinking of it as a function of theta for fixed y, then the thing in the denominator is just a constant, because it's for fixed y. So in fact, I can pull it out and put 1 over p of y in the front and just call it some constant, c. It stands for what people call a normalizing constant. It's just stuck in there to make everything add up to 1, because probabilities have to add up to 1 across all the different possibilities. So the denominator is a kind of normalizing constant. And truth to tell, in applying this Bayesian story, it's what you might call an, uh, an annoying normalizing constant, because it's actually hard to compute in a lot of problems. So we can dispense with it notationally because it's just it's constant as far as theta is concerned, but we may have some difficulty computing it later on. 
Now, P of theta is fine. It's just the information about theta, um, I'll, as I'll argue in a minute, the information about theta external to the present data set Y. But now look at this thing here. It starts out looking like the probability behavior for Y if you knew what theta was, but because I'm trying to use this equation in the opposite situation, the one in which I know what the y is, because I've got the data already, and I'm wondering what the theta is, I have to think of that thing there, p of y given theta, in the other way. I have to think of it as a function of theta for fixed y. A little bit like Alice in Wonderland um, imagining, uh, who was it, one of the queens, the red queen or somebody, imagining 10 impossible things before breakfast or whatever. It's just an object, a mathematical object, that's a function of both y and theta, and I can choose to either think of it as a probability density for y given theta, or I can think of it as a probability density for theta given y. I can think about it either way. At least I can think of it as a function of y for fixed theta or as a function of theta for fixed y. So p of y is a constant. OK, good. And this is what's called, people call this the sampling distribution for y given theta. It basically says in its original form, if I told you what the truth was, then how do you expect the data to come out? For instance, if you were watching a whole bunch of coin tossing going on with a coin that had a constant probability of being a heads, and I told you that the probability of heads was 0.7, you can now perhaps try to predict something about the likely patterns of heads and tails. In fact, there would be more heads probably than tails, for instance, and we could work out detailed things about that. Um, so it starts out looking like the sampling distribution for y given theta, but I have to think of it the other way around. I have to think of it as a function of theta for fixed y. The first person who noticed this was, um, actually, Mr. Bayes noticed it a little bit. The person who really noticed it was Laplace. Um, but the guy who got a, a lot of credit for thinking about it this way um, was this man Fisher I mentioned before, the statistician and geneticist. He did a better job of popularizing it than anybody had before. Um, you may have noticed that um, in the history of uh, ideas and so on, um, things are not always named for the person who first did them. Have you know, ever noticed that? Um, in fact, I had a colleague that I used to teach at the University of Chicago. Uh, his name is Steve Stigler, and he was a, a, a student of the history of statistics. And tongue-in-cheek, he invented something called uh, Stigler's Law of Eponymy, uh, eponymy being um, what things are named for. Stigler's Law of Eponymy says nothing is ever named for the guy who actually first thought it up, comma, including Stigler's Law of Eponymy. <laughs> uh, and so actually, this should be called, uh, should be called something else. Um, Laplace had a different name for it, but Fisher called it the likelihood function, and that name stuck. Fisher was the guy who really banged the drum for this idea. So he says, I'm going to take that sampling distribution and just think of it as a function of theta for fixed y and multiply it by any arbitrary positive constant. That was his name for it. And I'll show you an example of a likelihood function in a few minutes. Um, with this new notation, here is a new way to write down Bayes' theorem. And so um, L of theta given y represents the information about this theta thing internal to your data set y. But you can see in the Bayesian story that's only one of the two major ingredients that are necessary to combine. And I raised the question some minutes ago of how, in fact, you do combine information. You have some information before the new data set comes along. And now new information comes along. How do you combine those two sources of information in a rational way? This is the theorem that tells you how to do that. You quantify the earlier information in a probability distribution, p of theta. You quantify the data information through this thing called the likelihood function. And what Bayes' theorem says to do is you multiply them. And then you end up with a function of theta. And you draw it as a curve and work out the area underneath it. And if the area underneath it is 2, you divide the whole thing by 2 to make sure that the area underneath it is 1, because probabilities always have to add up to 1. So there's. There's the way, Bayes discovered the way to do optimal information processing. He didn't use these words. But back in the 1760s, he discovered the way to do optimal information processing in, in a sequential sort of way. When new information arrives, you quantify the old information with that object right there. You quantify the new information with this object right there. You multiply them, and you normalize. Already, he worked that out in 1750, roughly. Now, um, so. Um, this thing that Fisher called the likelihood function is only one of the two ingredients in the process of drawing together all the evidence about theta. As Bayes himself noticed, th there will typically also be information about theta external to the data set y. And p of theta is where this other information comes into the overall synthesis of knowledge. If I take logs of both sides of that multiplicative story, the log story becomes additive. And if I ignore the irrelevant um, normalizing constant, 
then the right left hand side could be referred to as the total information about theta and it can be thought of as the sum of two information sources here's the information external to the data set y about theta plus the information internal to the data set y about theta so basically Bayes theorem is saying how to combine those two sources of information and the combination is additive on the log scale now one way but not the only way you could think about the information about theta external to y is to mention what I said before you have information sometimes you have it before a new data set arriving and then you have information afterwards so it is true that learning is sequential the temporal event of observing the data set y divides the timeline into what you knew before the data arrived and what you know afterwards and so people have come to call um, this information external to y they've come to recall it they've come to call it the information prior to the period the moment when the data set y arrived and the latin for prior is a priori and so people call this the prior information and then this part here is called the data information or the likelihood information and then since this represents a synthesis of the information before the new data set arrived and, and also after and the latin for after is a posteriori so people call this thing over here the posterior information so that's the story so posterior information about theta is the sum of the prior information plus the likelihood information and so this thing p of theta given y people call it the posterior distribution that summarizes what you know about theta in light of your information all your information not just internal to the data set but also external and then p of theta uh, people call it the prior distribution these aren't very good names because actually it turns out that the thing which is called the posterior distribution is really the total information it should be called the total distribution not the posterior distribution because in fact there isn't necessarily anything temporal going on with respect to before and after the data set arrives um, but people have been using these words for more than 50 years now and so we're basically stuck with these words and so I'm going to use that language but it's better to think about the prior as bringing in all the information you have external to your data set about the thing you're wondering about and it's better to think about the posterior as the total information combining both the information internal to the data set and the information external to the data set and so now with this notation we have the um, words that are familiar to Bayes, Bayesian people the posterior distribution is equal to a constant times the prior distribution times the likelihood distribution so that's how to combine information optimally however this in itself creates a specification problem this way of looking at the world says you have to quantify information in terms of probability distributions and so how does a person actually do that and in fact if there's if there's seem to be two or three different ways to to think about doing it how do you know when one way is better than another so we have a specification task and we have an issue of trying to find optimal specification how do you quantify information about theta internal to y in that thing called the likelihood distribution how do you quantify information about theta external to y in the so-called prior distribution I'm going to give an example later of prior specification so how do you go about specifying this thing called the likelihood well if you step back a minute and think about what it means from a Bayesian point of view it's actually the predictive distribution for how the data will come out before any data have arrived and so how does a person go about specifying that well for a long time people used a method called parametric model specification this process of trying of having to say what the prior is and what the likelihood is brought together is what people call a model for the data statistically and trying to say what's a good choice for the prior distribution what's a good choice for the likelihood distribution is an example of picking a model choosing a model for example um, and in fact if you are being honest about it you discover that there's really two different layers of uncertainty going on you're uncertain about theta in any given problem of, of realistic complexity you're uncertain about theta and you're also uncertain about how to quantify your uncertainty about theta and so that gives rise to a second order uncertainty that people have for the last 15 years or so been referring to as model uncertainty and that has been one of the dominant things I've thought about in my research career um, this has been something that has just um, possessed me how do you quantify model uncertainty in a way that's well calibrated in which you pay the right price for not knowing what the what the model is that's a tough problem from when Bayes did things right through about 1937 people just ignored this problem instead they would just try to find a standard 
parametric family of probability distributions. So you may remember for your probability class, you have the, the binomial and the Poisson and you, for discrete data, and you've got the, um, the, the normal distribution and the exponential and all those distributions you learned about in your probability class. And so the off-the-shelf thing to do in the old days was to say, well, I'm going to hope that one of those standard distributions fits my data OK. And in fact, the real, the real thing to do in the older days was to nudge it along a little bit. You'd look at your data. <laughs> and if the data sort of looked like a normal curve, then you'd say, well, I'm going to pretend I knew all along that the right distribution for my data was normal. Now, the something for nothing bell might be ringing a little bit in your head, I hope, because what we just did was we used the data to choose the model, and then we used the same data to draw conclusions on the basis of the model. That's a kind of circularity. We're in effect pretending we know more than we actually do, and that will tend to lead to an underpropagation of uncertainty. You're going to end up pretending you know more than you do, and so that means your uncertainty bands for things are going to be narrower than they should be. So you will be poorly calibrated in the sense of not admitting as much uncertainty as you really have. And so um, what to do about that is something that has been interesting both for statisticians and for people in machine learning and other fields over the past 25 or 30 years. And um, you may be familiar with the idea of cross-validation, where you might divide your data into two parts and do modeling on one part and then see how well it validates on the other part. This is a way to try to beat that, that circularity. I'll have a little more to say about cross-validation as we go along today if there's time. So the standard thing to do would be to cheat and look at the data and pull out some standard family like the Bernoulli or the Poisson or the normal or whatever, and then pretend you knew somehow all along that those were the right distributions. That's called parametric statistical modeling. Um, clearly, there's a problem with it. Um, if you don't look at the data, if instead you try to think of what the distribution should be without looking at the data, well, what happens if when your data, data arrived, you see that the, the parametric model you picked was wrong? What do you do now? Um, you would like to go back and change your mind, um, but there's an embarrassing thing about the way uh, conditional probabilities work. If you put prior probability zero on something, then it turns out when you do the arithmetic, then the posterior probability for that thing has to be zero no matter what the data is. Also, if you put prior probability one on anything, then the posterior probability has to be one no matter how the data comes out. So this is a potential deep embarrassment for the Bayesian story. It's not a very good learning model <laughs> if you can't learn from data, right? So anything, formally, anything you stick prior probability zero on has to have posterior probability zero. And yet, if you, for example, pick the normal distribution for your data, and as you know, the normal distribution is symmetric and unimodal. It only has one highest place. And then you, the data arrives, and you make a picture of the data, and it's embarrassingly bimodal. What the hell do you do now? Because you put prior probability zero on bimodality by putting all your eggs in the, normal, in the normal curve basket, and now it looks as though you're in trouble. How do you somehow rescue yourself and go back and have a chance to change your mind? And this, from a formal point of view, was a serious objection to the Bayesian story for a long time. There are ways to beat it. There are ways to get around this. Um, a great um, English statistician named Dennis Lindley um, referred to this as Cromwell's rule. And um, um, there are ways to beat Cromwell's rule. And if there's time today, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, about how to do that. Um, so in fact, the real model is both the sampling distribution and the prior. But people have come to refer to just the sampling distribution as the model, which is a, not a good name for it, but that's what they that's what people have started to do. And the, this difficulty I've, I've, um, I've brought to your attention has now been called model uncertainty for a while now. So how do we solve the problem of model uncertainty? Um, well, I have myself um, come upon only three potential solutions to this problem. Um, and one of them is called Bayesian model averaging, or BMA for short. Each of these solutions has a little three-letter acronym. So one of them is something called BMA. Um, you could write down a whole set of possible models for the data, script M, let's call it, having model one, model two, and so on. And if you do it right, you can even shop around in the data to find what that collection of possible models could be, as long as you pay the right price for the shopping. And then if you push Bayes' theorem a little harder, you'll find that what it says to do is the following thing here. Your overall uncertainty about theta given the data set turns out to be a weighted average of your conditional uncertainty 
about theta, if you knew that model three was the right model, so to speak, weighted by the posterior plausibility of model three. So in other words, you take a weighted average of all the different um, distributions for your uncertainty about theta, having chosen particular models, and you take a weighted average of each of those things weighted by how plausible the models are. That just makes sense, right? You should give more weight to the models that are supported more by the data, but there's no reason why one model alone will have all the support. And so um, come up with a rich set of, of possibilities and then average over those possibilities using this version of Bayes' theorem. So that's a good idea. That's called Bayesian model averaging. I wrote about it some years ago. That's, that's the paper of mine that has been cited 850 times. And, uh, um, it was thought of well before me by an economist named Ed Lemer, but um, I was one of the people who, who founded the, the little subfield of Bayesian model averaging, and it's, it, it's just a good idea. Okay, um, now, uh, looking at the data to specify the model clearly is a form of cheating. And so, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I'm trying to lose some weight right now, um, and so I have a goal every day. Um, I don't want to take in any more than blah, blah net calories. But there's this piece of chocolate cake over there, and it looks really good, and it's 500 calories. Um, as long as you are thinking of doing the following um, in the middle of the day and well in between your sleep cycles, this turns out to be true. You can end up with pretty much exactly the same situation as far as your weight loss program is concerned by doing one or the other of these two things. Number one, don't eat the chocolate cake. Or number two, eat the chocolate cake and go right to the gym and work off 500 calories. And at the end of the day, your body will act as though those two things are equivalent, at least roughly equivalent for the purpose of losing the weight. And if you don't believe that, um, one of these uh, uh, food science guys um, lost, and wrote about it in a paper in a, in a major journal, lost 30 pounds not long ago over a period of about three months, subsisting only on things like Twinkies and Doritos chips. Basically, all that counts is the calories, the combination of the calories taken in and the calories burned off. And so cheating is like eating the chocolate cake. But if I'm right about the business about going in, to the gym and cycling on the bike and working off those calories, and I am actually, and physiologically speaking, you can talk with the nutrition people, then there should be an analog of that as well here. It's OK to cheat if you pay the right price for doing so. so I'm going to beat Cromwell's rule in this second way of doing things here by using a kind of threefold cross-validation. It's a, it's a somewhat new version of something that people in machine learning have been doing for a while. Here's what you do. You partition your data into three subsets, not just two. The standard way to do cross-validation has two subsets. You make a mutually exclusive and exhaustive partition into two subsets, modeling and validation, let's call them. And you model in the modeling part, and then you see how well that model validates in the validation part. And if it validates well, that's great. But what if it doesn't validate well? Then you have to go back and remodel and revalidate. And in my work with Kaiser, this happens all the time. Even in data sets with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of observations on patients, you can get situations where your initial model, which looked really plausible on your modeling data set, doesn't validate very well. So you want to go back and remodel and revalidate. When you're done with that iterative process, there's no data left over to see how well calibrated you are on future data that has not been part of the modeling process. So if life is like a Taylor series, and it is in many ways, um, let's just go out one more term in the Taylor series. And instead of doing twofold cross-validation, let's do threefold. So we'll have modeling and validation and calibration will be our three subsets. And now you model and validate and remodel and revalidate until you're happy. And then once you're done with that, you see how well the, the model that was organically arrived at through this iterative process and so on, see well, how well it calibrates on the third part of the data that was, ex that was explicitly set aside for that purpose. So you're able to announce to yourself and the world not only what you think the right answer is to the scientific question, but also how well the process that gave you that answer actually manages to hold up against future data. Uh huh. Would it, would maybe you come to the mic so you can be. Okay. So how is that different than just calibrating on the first two thirds? How do you get a different answer? Because 
if you calibrate on the first two thirds, um, then you're going to end up overstating how well you know what would happen on future data. Um, it's the same problem that we had. Suppose we talked about one fold cross validation where we just model and validate on the same data set. Then you're overestimating how well you'll do on future data. So that's why people invented two fold cross validation so that the second part was a proxy for future data. But the problem with two-fold cross-validation is that when you're done remodeling and revalidating, you don't have a third piece of data that proxies for future data to tell you how well the iterative process fits. And so that's why three-fold cross-validation seems like a good way to go. Um, and you can use, I'm going to talk about Bayesian decision theory a little bit later if there's time. You can use Bayesian decision theory to figure out how much of the data you should put into each of the three subsets. And that depends in turn on how much, you, how much emphasis you scientifically place on um, the quality of your answer versus the quality of your estimate of the calibration of your, of your answer. So um, those two things are both important and depending on how much weight you put in each one, there's a formal way to figure out how much data to put into each of the subsets. So, pre yes please. Well, indeed. Um, and um, uh, yes, the, um, uh, he said why stop at three and I'm going to just use a pragmatic answer. Um, um, as you know, Taylor series, when they're used in situations where they work well, um, has diminishing returns. Adding another term and another term after that, you get to a point where it doesn't matter anymore. And I have tried fourfold cross validation on real problems in my own work, and I found that that fourth step doesn't change things. So basically, I'm, I'm comfortable with getting something new by going from two to three but I don't find it necessary practically to go any farther. But your point, you, 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 there's an infinite regress potentially, right? Why do, why do I stop at three? And the answer turns out just to be um, the Taylor series is sort of diminished enough that you don't need to. Uh -huh. Yes, um, that, uh, why you wouldn't want to go to fourfold cross validation, you mean? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. Um, that does sound like it could plausibly be related. That, that's, for, that's homework for me. Um, so, okay, so um, pretending you know the actual data generating mechanism when you don't, which is what you're doing when you're cheating by looking at the data, clearly that's a form of understatement of your uncertainty, and this threefold cross validation solves this by appropriately widening your uncertainty bands for pay, to pay for having cheated. Because you're actually building your uncertainty bands only on the first two subsets. You've deliberately set aside, let's say, a, a quarter of your data. And so compared with your statements you would make on the whole data set, your statements now are a bit wider than they were before. And they're an appropriately wider amount based upon how much emphasis you place on the calibration process. So yes, please. Um, I typically, in a regression context, for example, where I might have um, 50,000 rows, uh, I, would, I would partition those 50,000 rows in a way such that the typical composition of the three subsets was similar. So the Bayesian word for it is exchangeably, and the simplest way to do it is a random partition. Um, with a big data set, you only have to do the random partitioning once. Things are quite stable. With a small data set, if you really need to know what's going on, you have to do this 3CV multiple times with multiple partitions and then see how stable things are across the partitions. Uh, it, it can work in even small and moderate data sets as well. Yes? Yes, if you were only to put one observation in the modeling part of things, you'd be in trouble, right? Um, so that's correct. Um, and it comes out of the, the calculations in the decision theory. Yes. OK, so that's been um, two of the ways to beat this problem. There's a third way, which if we have time later on, I can show you an example of in the encyclopedia article. Um, if you're trying to be careful not to put prior probability zero on anything, well, then there actually turns out to be a technical way not to, 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 to do that, to, to not put prior probability zero on, on anything that isn't, um, so in some sense, worth putting prior probability zero on. 
What you have to be able to do, and there's a lot of ma hard math on this slide, I'm just going to uh, wave my hands, but basically um, what you have to be prepared to do is to put a distribution not just on a number, for instance if theta was a number between 0 and 1, putting a distribution on a number um, isn't that hard it turns out uh, in a way that's scientifically reasonable. Um, it's not just putting a distribution on a number or a vector or a matrix. To do this thing here, which is called Bayesian nonparametrics, you have to be prepared to put a distribution on an entire function. And so you may remember from your initial probability work that one of the basic ways to summarize the distribution of something that lives on the real line is through something called the cumulative distribution function, which measures the chance of, of this unknown thing being below a series of points. And so when you collect all those different values of that together, you get something called capital F, the cumulative distribution function. And you have to be prepared from a Bayesian point of view to place a distribution on that. And then once you do that, you're able to acknowledge your uncertainty in a way that, that takes care of all possibilities. De Finetti, uh, the, the uh, great Italian statistician, figured out how to do the, that this was the right thing to do back in the 1930s. He didn't have the slightest idea how to place probability distributions on functions in the 1930s. No one knew how to do it then. It's, it's hard work. And it only began being looked at carefully uh, mathematically in the 1970s. And it's only since the, the middle 1990s that we've had Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms for actually um, doing it. But basically now we know how to do that. And so you can see from a logical point of view, if you're worried about trying hard not to put prior probability zero on anything because of that Cromwell's rule idea. Well, here's a mathematical way to really do that, to, put, to, to avoid placing prior probability zero on anything. But the math is much harder, and uh, you can read the encyclopedia article. There's an example of what happens when you do that in, in there. We may not have time to get to it. A bit more about the um, history and where, where this Markov chain idea came in. So the Pasteur distribution completely solves the inference problem, but how do you compute it? Um, history second Bayesian was this guy Laplace, a better Bayesian than Bayes. He was a much better mathematician. Um, in the late 1700s, around 1780, Laplace independently rediscovered Bayes' theorem and extended it from propositions to settings in which the unknown theta is a vector of real numbers. And so now what we have is that y is a vector of real numbers of length n, and theta is a vector of real numbers of length k. And you don't actually have to change the theorem any because all these things make, still make sense if you remember back to your probability course. This is a distribution in k dimensions. This is a distribution in k dimensions. You can multiply two of them and normalize. You get another distribution in k dimensions. So the math works out fine. But now all these things are probability distributions on um, a, a high dimensional space. And um, when the kind of problems that Bayes worked on k in this story was one or two, and the kind of problems that Laplace worked on, k was up to about 10 as of the late 1700s and early 1800s. But today, we are using this machinery when k might be in the hundreds or even thousands. So let's think through what the challenge is here. First of all, you have to find out what that number c is to be able even to work with this as a proper probability distribution. So you have to compute a k-dimensional integral to serve as the normalizing constant. Um, we all learned some calculus a long time ago, I bet, and uh, mostly we focused on one-dimensional integrals, and there was a little bit about two or three-dimensional integrals probably for physics and so on, maybe even four-dimensionals for, for um, uh, including time and so on. But I bet you didn't have much coverage in your calculus class about how to, how to exactly compute 100-dimensional integrals. Uh, and and the one reason is that there are hardly any functions that you can integrate in closed form in 100 dimensions. Um, um, so then the problem becomes, how do you approximate high dimensional integrals in a decent way? And um, Bayes didn't understand that problem existed. Laplace did understand that problem existed. It's worse than that, though, because if k was some big number, even think of a number only like 10, how do you visualize a 10 dimensional distribution? We are not capable as humans of visualizing such a distribution. So how do you visualize it? Well, the best way to, to, to uh, get at it is is like that old parable about the blind man and the elephant. You try to take one-dimensional slices of it. You only see different parts of the elephant, right? So um, I'm going to focus on just the part for, for component one and just the part for component two and so on. And it turns out when you write down the, the math for how to do that, you have to compute each of those requires a k minus one dimensional integral. And there's k of them to do. So if, if k was 100, you have 199 dimensional integrals to get all these things that are called the marginal distributions. 
Laplace, I mentioned before, worked out a, a way to do this, and, and we now refer to his method as Laplace approximations. It just was based on Taylor series and the, the multivariate normal curve. Um, and then people forgot about it. Um, now we use it all the time. But it turns out not to be as general as the Markov chain way that people are using today. Now, a little bit more about the background here. All or almost all inferential work from the moment Bayes died until when Fisher first wrote his paper about maximum likelihood, all this work was Bayesian. For example, um, Gauss um, did a bunch of um, statistical work in astronomy. Laplace, all these guys were Bayesian in their focus. Francis Galton, who invented regression, was Bayesian in his way of thinking about probability. Carl Pearson, who invented chi-square and correlation, all the stuff these people did was Bayesian. Even Fisher, when he was first trying to think about this idea called maximum likelihood, and he first wrote about it in 1915, he reasoned completely in the Bayesian paradigm. Then Fisher read some books. Um, one of them was written by this guy, John Venn, back in 1866. It was called The Logic of Chance. And Fish, Venn, in this book, introduced the frequentist approach to probability. And the reason that he did this was he said, basically, the only thing that could have any objective reality is watching repeatable processes. That's the only thing. And so for him, the probability of a particular coin coming out heads, that was an, in, that was an objective property of the coin. It didn't have anything to do with how the coin was tossed. It was an objective property of the coin. That turns out to be false, by the way, if you study the physics of coin tossing. Anybody who knows what they're doing can take any coin and make it land heads every time. Um, so that sort of way of looking at things was false, even for the simple example that he looked at. But he was interested in this idea of objectivity. Um, uh, he was part of the late Victorian movement in science. Um, the English uh, ran the world in those days. and. Um, they were completely top nation, and they wanted to be top nation in science also. They had a kind of arrogance in everything they did, and they thought that the right way to do science was to involve this notion called objectivity. And what Venn meant by that was that um, two scientists with the same data set should reach exactly the same conclusions. Now, that sounds plausible until you remember that the role of science is to accumulate, not just to look at any single data set in isolation, but to try to build upon what people knew before you, and at each stage come up with an answer that reflects not only what you have discovered in your new data set, but is also responsive to what was known before you. In other words, you have to appeal to information external to the present data set to do a good job of synthesizing information in science. And so, actually, Venn's idea of objectivity is not something that we would want. It's actually uh, a bad thing to have because two scientists with the same data set but different information external to that data set should reach different conclusions if the goal of science is to come up with a summary of the totality of information. And so, but from Venn's point of view, he was worried about this idea from the Bayesian story of having to bring in this thing called the prior distribution. And um, so, basically, um, he announced that uh, the only objective version of probability should be one that doesn't have to involve bringing in any of this prior information stuff. Now, you guys all know from having had a lot of experience with computer programs, um, if there's a program that has a big user base and there's an aspect of the program that some of the users really like and that same aspect of the program others in the user community really hate, there's a little war about the words about it. The people who like it call it a feature. <laughs> the people who don't like it call it a bug. <laughs> and it's the same aspect of the program. It's just people have different attitudes about it. So for Mr. Venn and the people like him, the need to bring in information external to the present data set was a bug. But in fact, when you take the, the, the point of view about science being an arc over accumulating information over generations and so on, it's not a bug, it's a feature. You have to be prepared to bring in information external to your data set so that science can accumulate properly. And the problem really with his position is that um, he was trying to deny the reality that everything humans do is subjective, by which I mean based on assumptions and judgments. And both science in general and statistical inference in particular are examples, and, and I'll give um, an, an example now. Um, essentially, again, good scientists exercise good judgment and bad scientists exercise bad judgment. That's one way we know who's a good scientist and a bad scientist. 
Um, so that's one thing to say. And the other thing to say is that all probability and statistical modeling, uh, when you first heard about probability, there was only one right answer to every problem. But in fact, as you probably know, any of you who've uh, tried to analyze big data sets, it's not true on big data sets that there's only one plausible answer to, to the same problem. Um, all work of this kind involves assumptions and judgments. Suppose that you and I and everybody else in the room are given a big data set with 10,000 observations where the outcome variable is a one or zero for whether someone defaults on a loan. And there are a lot of variables, 500 of them, of variables xj, let's say, that have to do with the person's credit history that may or may not be useful in predicting loan status. So I'm going to give you a data set with 10,000 rows and 501 columns. And the uh, outcome variable in the first column is a dichotomy, one if the loan defaulted and zero if not. And I give you 500 predictors to, to try to use to, pick, to predict that. And then after that, we're all given a particular set of input values for the predictive variables and asked to work independently to predict the probability of default for that individual. Will we all get the same answer? In fact, uh, you were talking about, someone was talking about a competition, right? There's a competition about analyzing medical data. Um, reasonable people with the same data set will not get the same answer. That's the nature of that competition. It's inherent in the way that competition worked. And the reason is that there are so many judgment calls in building a model to do this that the model building process is inherently subjective because it is based upon assumptions and judgments. Uh, and statisticians would build what's called a generalized linear model. So which link function would you use? Uh, how should the x's enter the prediction process? Should they come in linearly or quadratically or some other way? What subset of the x's should be used? Which interactions amongst the x's should be in the model? There's all these different things you have to decide when building models like this. Or am I going to use a neural network? Or am I going to use some other thing? Um, you know, uh, am I going to use a generalized additive model? What am I going to use? Um, we're all going to get different answers on the same data set. And it's because we're all running with different sets of assumptions and judgments. We all may be using this so-called standard objective tools for model selection, but they aren't really objective. I think the only reason that Van could have believed it was a good goal that two scientists with the same data set should reach the same conclusion was that he never did a complicated data analysis in his life. It was too early. It was 1866. He'd never done it. Anybody who has ever done this would understand immediately that Venn's idea was stupid. Uh huh. Well, um, the hallmark, as I said earlier, uh, of scientific theories is how well they predict observables that were not used in the process of their formulation. Um, and uh, everybody is free in the game of science to come up with um, little prediction engines. Um, and if it turns out that someone comes up with one that predicts observables extraordinarily well that are not predicted by other prediction engines, then we can try to reverse engineer it and see what were the, the underlying principles that led to that. Um, um, yes. Um, but the problem was that the ether story didn't explain the observables as well as the story that came after it. Because when we were able to do things like um, that experiment where they actually looked to see where Mercury was relative to where you would have thought it was if you were using Newton, for example. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Um, so um, I, I take your point. But the basic story here is that everything we do in science is inherently subjective. And that means that our goal should not be to try to achieve something that's not possible. Instead, it should be to try to be as explicit as we possibly can be about the assumptions and judgments that led to our conclusions and share those assumptions and judgments with everybody else so that they can, in turn, judge their own plausibility of those. So it seems to me that, like it says here, the goal in statistical work should not be to try to do something that we can't do, but instead to make all of our assumptions and judgments as clear as possible. And then, secondly, 
to see how sensitive the conclusions are to reasonable perturbations in the assumptions and judgments. So I find myself wanting clarity. And one of the good things about the Bayesian paradigm is it forces you to be explicit not only about the likelihood function, but also about this prior distribution. Um, it turns out that the, everything you do in the frequency story is a special case of the Bayesian story with hidden assumptions about the prior information. And so isn't it better to be explicit about the thing that you're assuming implicitly anyway as part of this transparency movement? So let's get it all out there. And then also uh, let's do rigorous sensitivity analyses to see how whether all ro roads really do lead to Rome with respect to conclusions as far as um, the assumptions and judgments go. So between 1915 and 1922, Fisher read Venn's book. <laughs> And so he was much taken with Fisher's, with Venn's point of view. So he recanted his original Bayesian um, motivation for maximum likelihood and uh, came up with a purely frequentist motivation for it. And he tried to stick with the frequency story for the rest of his life. Um, he tried to create a frequentist interpretation of the likelihood function. Um, um, and um, he, what he ended up with was uh, a theory that turns out to be a good approximation to the Bayesian story under, under certain conditions. And it was a very good um, thing he did for the year 1922 because the integrals were too hard. Um, so maybe I'll take a few minutes and show you one example in which we get all the way to a Bayesian answer and that would be enough for tonight because you know, I don't want to um, take your time too much. I have a hospital in Santa Cruz in mind, the Dominican hospital, and I'm going to watch a stream of patients, all of whom entered the hospital with heart attack. And I'm going to try to predict the 400 ones and zeros about who lives and who dies. So there's going to be a string of 400 ones and zeros for living or not um, in the hospital mortality or mortality as of 30 days from hospital admission, something like that. So standing back before the data arrives, what may be said about these roughly 400 ones and zeros that I'm going to observe? I'm uncertain about all of them, and I have to tell a story involving either frequentist probability or Bayesian probability. The frequentist approach is based on the idea of hypothetical or actual repetitions of some process. And so when faced with a data set like this, the usual way to tell a story involving repeating something over and over again is to think of the data set as, as either literally a random sample or like a random sample from some broader universe, some population. And then the probability comes in and think about what other data sets I might have gotten instead of the one I actually did get if I were to hypothetically repeat the process of getting the data. And when you do that, you end up having to write down um, your basic frequentist model would be that these ones and zeros behave in an independent and identically distributed manner, meaning that they don't influence each other and they all have the same probability behavior, and they follow the usual one zero sort of story. Everybody is a one with probability theta and a zero with probability one minus theta. So you write out what's called the joint sampling distribution and you um, uh, mess about with it for a minute, and eventually you get the following function. You get theta to the s times 1 minus theta to the n minus s, where s is the sum of the, ones and, uh, sum of the ones and zeros. It counts how many people actually died. So with my data set, with 400 people of whom 72 died, um, what does the likelihood function look like? I can plot it without much trouble. And over there on the left is um, what it looks like over the entire interval from 0 to 1 for theta. You'll notice it involves some really small numbers. Um, this is done in R, and R is capable of working with numbers as small as something like uh, 10 to the minus 3 or 400. So it's, it, it didn't have any problem with that. But um, there it is, and I've held a magnifying glass up to it over here. And so what does that look like to you guys? Fisher calls that the likelihood function. He's not thinking of it as a probability density. In fact, as soon as he thinks of it as a probability density, he's doing something Bayesian. So he's trying really hard not to think of it as a probability density because he doesn't want to have to bring in the prior distribution. So for him, it's just a function that he's going to try to figure out what's a number that would be a good number to carry away from that function. And he said without much motivation, I'm just going to find the value of theta that maximizes this function. And he called it the maximum likelihood estimate. And it turns out to be an obvious thing to do here. It turns out to be just 72 over 400, uh, which is 18%. But Think of this from the Bayesian point of view. This is one of the ingredients in Bayes' theorem, and we are allowed to think of it as like a distribution. And what curve does it look like to you guys? It looks like a normal curve to me. Um, and so he can't say that because he doesn't want to think of it as a density. That would be a Bayesian thing to do. But he just thinks of it as a function he's trying to maximize. And so that's, he gets the so-called maximum likelihood estimate. Also, in his day, it would have been um, pretty dodgy to work with numbers that small. 
How did these numbers get that small? Well, we multiplied a whole bunch of things that were between 0 and 1 together. And so to avoid underflow, it would be better to take the log, right? Because the log of the product is the sum of the logs, and nothing bad can happen. So he based most of his work not on the Likert function, but on the logarithm of the Likert function. And of course, if things do look like a normal curve, when you take the logarithm, you're going to get something that looks like a bowl-shaped down parabola, because that's at the heart of the formula for the normal curve. And so um, the log likelihood function is what, in the jargon, is called locally quadratic around its maximum. That means it's going to be easy to find the maximum, and you'll be able to learn something about how much uncertainty you have from that. So he finds in this problem here that the so-called maximum likelihood estimate is just the ordinary mean of the ones and zeros. That, that makes pretty good sense. Um, and he has a method, which I don't have time to share with you, about um, how to come up with an uncertainty band around that. Um, and when he does that, he ends up with um, square root of theta hat is his maximum likelihood estimate. He ends up with square root of theta hat times 1 minus theta hat over n as his give or take for that. And then he's built, he builds an interval by starting at the estimate and going roughly two of those either way. So that's his story for building uh, estimates of things and intervals for them. The Bayesian story is very different because our goal at the beginning is there aren't any thetas floating around here. There's just a bunch of ones and zeros. And your fundamental goal is to try to predict what those, 100, those 400 ones and zeros are going to, how they're going to behave. And a guy, this guy, De Finetti, I mentioned before, um, was able to demonstrate under plausible assumptions. Again, I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to gloss over much of this to get to the, the bottom line. Um, he was able to show that essentially um, all, all the reasonable models for a data set like this had the same thing that Fisher had in the second line, that if you knew what theta was, the y's would be iid Bernoulli theta. But you have to be prepared to think of some, theta as something that itself, uncertainty about it can be quantified by means of a distribution. In other words, um, the, I, the Bayesian idea of using distributions to quantify uncertainty came directly out of a simple theorem that Definetti was able to prove. And so basically, Fisher got this part right, but he tried to avoid this part. And in effect, what he did then was to put in, well, let's see. If he's trying to avoid putting in a prior at all, that's like combining the actual data set with an external data set that has almost no information in it. If he's trying to avoid having to specify a prior, that's the same as basically not putting one in at all. And that means he's putting in a prior that has almost no information content. And so you can think about it. The, the theta lives between 0 and 1. What are some distributions that represent this, the position that you don't know much about what theta is? It's probably going to be kind of flat, because that would be like saying small thetas are about equally likely as big thetas. So for instance, the uniform distribution would be an example of a, a, the sort of prior that Fisher has secretly hidden inside his maximum likelihood story. Anything else that's relatively constant, wherever the likelihood is big, will have the same effect on things, it turns out. Priors like that are called diffuse because they spread the probability out across the whole range in a, in a very diffuse way rather than being very concentrated. And in this problem here, uh, any diffuse prior you want to write down is going to get an answer that's similar to what Fisher gets because we have a lot of data and not much information, uh, in this case, external to the present data set. Um, the information I had was that um, this particular hospital I know that um, I can look on the web and find out that the typical 30-day heart attack uh, death rate is about 15%. I don't know much about what's going on at this hospital, but I would be very surprised, having lived in Santa Cruz for 10 years, if the actual rate was really, really good or really, really bad, because I would have heard about it by now. So I'm going to try to construct a prior that has most of its probability between a 5% mortality rate and a 30% mortality rate. And I, I will need to do sensitivity analysis on the 5 and the 30. And when you do that, you end up with uh, a family of curves on the interval from 0 to 1 that's quite flexible. It's a family of distributions called the beta distributions. And there's lots of them uh, representing all sorts of symmetric and skewed behavior and so on. And when I do some calculations, I discover that this is the prior that corresponds to the information that I had in mind. So it's concentrated at a number not too far from 18%. But it has a lot of spread around there. I, would be, I wouldn't have been very surprised, based on the prior, to see a value of around 15%, give or take about 6 or 7 percentage points. In other words, my prior information, it wasn't completely diffuse, but it was rather diffuse. It's, it's spread out over a pretty broad range from 0 to about 0.4. Now, Bayes' theorem says I should combine these things. And it turns out, in the arithmetic, that 
uh, the Bayes story says multiply two things, and it turns out that the beta distribution has the same mathematical form as that likelihood function did, and the product of two such things is another such thing, namely theta to a power times one minus theta to another power. And so it turns out that if the prior distribution in this problem is a beta, the posterior distribution is another member of the beta family. And that's called something called conjugate updating. And uh, it turns out that you can actually work out the information content of the data set based upon that. It turns out that I have 400 observations worth of data in the actual sample, and it turns out that my prior is equivalent to about 30 observations worth of data, centered at, um, at that number 0.15. And this is maybe the takeaway picture. I'll stop um, 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 pretty much here and um, show you what you get. Bayes' theorem tells you how to combine information from two different information sources. This is the information from the data right there, the, the likelihood function that Fisher used. This is the information external to the present data set. And it turns out that if you start with a beta externally, you end up with another beta. That's the, that's the combined information across both information sources. And it's a very good form to always plot the prior and the likelihood and the posterior on the same plot. I can um, work out, I can take the likelihood function and figure out the right constant multiple of it so that the error underneath it is one. Then all three of them are proper density functions and I can look at them. And so what do you guys see happening in this picture here? Has the prior had a lot of influence on the answer? See how the prior is relatively flat in the region where the likelihood is appreciable. So no surprise, the posterior and the likelihood almost coincide with each other. So this is an example where, the, where Fisher and the Bayesian story, using my information data set, my information database external to this present data set, this is a situation where Fisher's story and my story would give similar answers. But that will not necessarily always be true. In fact, it's not necessarily true. Here are some circumstances in which the two approaches give rather different answers. If you have strong information external to the present data set that you're willing to really put your money on, then you're going to get an answer that's quite different from Fisher's likelihood approach. And the question then becomes, is your answer better or worse than Fisher's answer? And the answer to that question depends upon the quality of that external, external information. If you have brought in strong information, for example, if your study is one in a long series of studies that are really similar to each other, and you use the information from the previous studies to inform your prior, then you're going to get out a better answer than Fisher does, basing, basing his analysis only on the information from the latest study. Because you've done something which is more cumulative in, in the more of the spirit of learning from our ancestors and so on scientifically, you will get a better answer. If you bring in strong information external to the data set that turns out in retrospect to have been badly out of step with reality, then you'll get a worse answer than Fisher. So there's no free lunch in the Bayesian story. It's giving you an opportunity to combine information external to your data set. That information can take both qualitative and quantitative forms. If you're trying to estimate a function, your prior information might be that you really think scientifically that function should be relatively smooth. And if you just do a likelihood analysis, the function may well come out very jaggedy. And so that's an example where the Bayesian story gives you a better answer by bringing in information that's scientifically motivated that says the right answer should be smooth. So I'm going to bring that in through the prior, and I'll get out a better answer that way by bringing in information of a qualitative nature that was not present in the data set itself. And so um, if you um, wanted to bring in the judgment that What's going on now, what's going on day after tomorrow is more likely to be like what's going on in the last two weeks than it is three months ago, then your modeling will produce an answer that's different from somebody who doesn't bring that assumption in. And your answer will be better than theirs if your, your extra assumption was a good one and worse if it was not. And one good way to find out ahead of time is to um, divide up the past into intervals in which you pretend that now is some point that actually isn't now, it's, it's in the past and you try out your way of forecasting against the other way, and you see who does a better job in the past of forecasting what turns out to be the known future, because you actually ran the clock back. Um, so um, the Bayesian story provides you with an opportunity to combine information from multiple sources in a way that's very natural and matches the way the scientific process unfolds. Also, it turns out that um, the, um, 
maximizing a likelihood function is not necessarily a very good way to summarize it. If this were the likelihood function, then the maximum does not agree with other simple summaries of, of its center. And you can end up with problems. There's some material about this further on in the talk that I won't have time to cover today. There are examples in which maximizing the likelihood function produces really bad answers because the likelihood function has a spike right at zero and then falls down like that. And so you're thinking about trying to summarize information about a variance, for example, and the likelihood function takes its maximum right at zero and then falls down from there. The maximum likelihood approach would have you believe that that variance is identically zero because that's where the maximum occurs. It's a kind of J-shaped distribution where everything, all the mass lives to the right of zero, but the maximum occurs um, right at zero. So the maximum likelihood approach says, well, you should think that that variance is zero, and that turns out to propagate through to all the other calculations in the model and produces uncertainty bands that are too narrow because that amount of variability was not brought along through the other calculations. So the Bayesian approach, which instead of maximizing over the likelihood function, integrates over it, treats it as something that needs to be integrated over, that turns out to just produce better answers in small samples or even big samples when the likelihood function looks very much not like a normal curve. If your likelihood function looks a lot like a normal curve and there isn't much information external to the data set, then the likelihood story is going to be about the same as the Bayesian story. And you might as well go ahead and do the likelihood thing because it's going to be a lot faster because it's based on differentiation rather than integration. But if the likelihood function looks a lot different from a normal curve and or if you have a lot of information external to the present data set, then you will get a different answer with the Bayesian approach than you will with the likelihood approach, and you have a pretty good chance of getting a better answer by using information in a, in a way that, that matches reality better. Uh -huh. MCMC? Um, what, what MCMC does is it um, is based upon um, a very simple idea uh, that Metropolis and Ulam noticed in the early 1940s, namely, anything you want to know about any probability distribution, no matter how high dimensional, as long as its dimensionality is finite, anything you want to know about that distribution, you can learn to arbitrary accuracy by having a way of drawing random samples from it. So imagine that you have a 500 dimensional probability distribution and you want to learn about it. If you can figure out some way to correctly make random draws from that distribution, then you can make thousands and thousands of such draws and arrange them into something that you would call the MCMC data set, one row for each draw from the distribution and one column for each of the components of the, of the particular distribution you're working with. And then once you've done with that, simple descriptive summaries of each column provide you with the information you're interested in. Do you want to know what does the posterior mean for component 12? Well, you just take your hands and you cover over components 1 through 11 and 13 through 500, you ignore them all and you take the mean of those draws in that column there. And that produces a Monte Carlo estimate of the posterior mean for that component. Anything you want to know about that distribution can be learned to arbitrary accuracy by having a way of taking random samples. That's, that's how we do the integration numerically. And uh, the very first methods that were invented by John von Neumann and other people for making draws, random draws from, from, um, uh, from distributions were based on the concept of making independent, identically distributed draws from the distribution. But it turns out that you don't need to make independent draws. As long as you make draws that have um, the correct, if ever, any of you have ever studied time series, if you can construct a, a time series that's called stationary, meaning that it's fluctuating around but always hanging around the same distribution, basically, if you can construct a stationary time series, then it turns out that taking the average of values from a stationary time series is also a good way to estimate the average of the underlying process that you're studying. That's right. Gibbs sampling is a special case of Markov chain Monte Carlo. And the, so uh, it was discovered when von Neumann first put forward his idea of how to do this, that his method, it was called rejection sampling. It doesn't work very well in high dimensions. And so, um, so Metropolis and his colleagues said, well, can we generalize von Neumann's rejection sampling somehow? Um, what is the very simplest time series? It's one that's where the draws are completely independent. So let's try generalizing it, making it a little bit more complicated. What's the next simplest time series you could invent? And the answer is a first order Markov chain. 
have a process unfold in time in such a way that the only thing you need to know to predict where it's going to go next is where it is now. And they were lucky. They got lucky. It turned out that it was possible to construct a Markov chain that was stationary, whose stationary distribution was the posterior distribution that you're interested in sampling from. And having done that, you can simply run the Markov chain. You may start it off at a stupid place, and then it has to reach equilibrium. That's called the burn-in period. You throw the burn-in period away, and then you simply monitor from that point on. Because once such a process is in equilibrium, is stationary, then it never leaves stationarity. You just run it for a long time. And so that's what I meant about desktop computers around 1990 giving you an answer in 12 hours, for example. These days, um, we're able to do MCMC calculations on problems where you have hundreds or thousands of parameters and get a, get a good answer in a few hours with contemporary computing speeds. Um, MCMC, the main flaw of it is that it doesn't necessarily scale very well in the number of rows in your data set. Um, uh, so if you have many, many uh, repetitions, for example, if you, if you have a, a data set in, in search and there's one row for each time somebody went looking for something and the, the outcome variable was where they clicked, for example, uh, if you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of rows in this data set and then many different predictor columns, if the relationship between the outcome and the predictors is complicated, it's possible that MCMC won't scale very well. As your data set gets bigger and bigger, it'll get slower and slower to give you good answers. So uh, it has to do with um, whether there are, no, it's not actually interactions. It's worse than that. Um, it's whether um, there's a finite set of numbers that can be computed just by simple processes of averaging and multiplication and so on um, that represent, if you've ever had any statistics, um, it's called a set of uh, sufficient statistics for the thing that you're working with. Um, you do dimensionality reduction. For example, in that Bernoulli model, you have 400 ones and zeros, but it turns out that if you look at the likelihood function, all you need to know is the mean of the numbers. Um, and so you do dimensionality reduction from 400 numbers down to one by focusing only on the mean. And that's called a sufficient statistic because that's the only number you need to know to be able to trace out the whole likelihood function. If you can find sufficient statistics, then it doesn't matter whether the data set has 400 rows in it or 4 billion rows. It just collapses down to adding up 4 billion numbers, and you can do that really quickly. But most of the interesting models we're fitting these days do not have sufficient statistics that are any smaller dimensionality than the data set itself. And in that case, MCMC can be crap. It can, it can take a very, very long time. So there's a big movement in machine learning to try to come up with algorithms that, that approximate what MCMC is doing using MCMC as a gold standard, but trying to get an answer that's almost as good in one-tenth of the time, computing time, or one one-hundredth one of the computing time, for instance. Uh, So-called variational methods um, are popular in machine learning these days. Michael Jordan and people like that have been working on that. So one of the challenges to the Bayesian paradigm is to figure out how to get the computing to scale with more and more data, because the gold standard computing approach, this MCMC thing, doesn't run very fast on big data sets. So new, new computing methods are needed. Um, I'm thinking, along with many other people, about the basic topic of um, how, do you, how do you make rigorous the process of model specification. At the moment, watch your own work when you build models for things. What we're doing basically is something that's pretty ad hoc in the way we build models. We, we build one and we poke the data with it, and if it doesn't look right, then we change it a little bit and try to make it look better and so on. Uh, in my opinion, this is not yet mathematics. This is pre-mathematics. We are fumbling. Um, uh, you, you, you know you're doing mathematics when you have distilled the problem into the following progression. There are some underlying principles. From them, I can extract a few axioms. And with those axioms, I can prove a theorem that says the optimal way to do whatever it is you're interested in doing is blah, blah. And so a sequence of, of uh, logic from principles through axioms to theorems, we understand how to do that with probability. It turns out that this Bayesian interpretation I've been showing you here today, in which the fundamental is the truth, of a, the truth status of a true-false proposition, there is a logical progression from principles to axioms to a theorem that says basically this is the only way to quantify uncertainty that does not violate principles of internal logical consistency. So for me, applied probability is on a sound mathematical footing because of this progression from principles to axioms to theorems. We do not have such a progression for the process of specifying our models. 
and we have, what we have is a bunch of pre-mathematics. We have a bunch of ad hocaries at the moment. And so that's one of the things I'm working on. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you presented that in my mind, it was like this, this, uh, this idea, which has been in statistics since 1995, is now being taken up in the machine learning world under the name ensemble learning. So and so, do you think that that is uh, kind of like, I mean, it's, it seems still an ad hoc and it's, it's still required lots of tuning, but that's kind of like the path where we're going to get to, you know, this portfolio of models and eventually having a, an optimization scheme which is good enough. That is the path. That's right. Um, because what that does is it moves toward a world in which we really are trying to embrace all possibilities and let the data help us pick out the good ones. So what are the challenges? Because it's still requires lots of language right? so Yes. Um, if, if you believe in the concept of a true underlying data generating mechanism, so if you believe in the fiction that whatever, however the data was, was, um, came to you, it's as though the Wizard of Oz was behind a curtain over there, and he knows how he generated that data for you, and he's prepared to give you more data from that particular mechanism. That's a fiction, which may sometimes be a useful fiction. Yeah, it's, it's essentially an assumption of stationarity, and uh, uh, anybody who works in economics should be aware of that assumption. Um, um, most people doing search should be aware of it too over too broad a time horizon, I would guess. Um, anyway. If you believe in the concept, if you're prepared to think of the Wizard of Oz idea of an under, a true underlying data generating mechanism, um, then what you want to try to do is to make your ensemble big enough so that at least some of the models in your ensemble are close to that thing. Let's call it M sub DG for data generating. You want to try to make your ensemble rich enough so that at least some of the components in the ensemble are close to that thing, whatever it is, and that's the challenge, right? Because it could be practically anything and somehow you want to try to get your ensemble to be rich enough so that it includes some stuff that's close to that because then what will happen is that you can prove a theorem actually that shows that with more and more data the Bayesian story will tend to pile up most of its mass on those components in your ensemble that are the closest to the true data generating mechanism in a particular notion of distance. Uh -huh. Um, well, I, I agree with you, um, and so, and it, it, he, he said, isn't this basically another one of those infinite regress sort of things? Um, uh, the, the main way that, that practical way I've tried to share with you tonight about how to beat the problem of model uncertainty in a simple fashion is with that threefold cross-validation idea. So I don't know what the right model is. I have a powerful desire to shop around in the data for plausible models. I know, but I, but I need to be able to uh, pay the right price for that shopping, otherwise I'm going to end up with answers that are too optimistic, that don't have wide enough uncertainty bands. So um, maybe we have to stop now because someone else needs the room, um, or we're just all finishing. Anyway, um, the, the point is uh, I encourage you um, to, to, to read over that part of this, this presentation and try it out on your own problems. It, it actually really does work. A half a, half a quarter a quarter is a, is a reasonable place to start with the allocation of data into those three subsets. Half modeling, quarter validation, quarter calibration is a, is a reasonable place to start. And I have talked a little bit even beyond um, when I was supposed to stop. So thank you very much for your interest in these ideas.